Tiffany. Hi, I'm Cooper. And this is Done It Now. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been really good. That was good. That might be the intro. Can you believe it? We have been working on the Then and Now blog post series about old houses in Bellingham for over six months now. You might not know, but this series all started with an idea from that guy. <laughs> the guy behind the camera right now. It all started with this amazing idea that he had to go take pictures of old houses and for me to research some of the backstory behind the people and the places that made Whatcom County and Bellingham what it is today. And so I figured, cool, I'll just look up some stories about old houses, write a blog post or two, and we'll see where it goes. And now, 22 blog posts later, we have covered every single house with a Bellingham address that is listed on the National Historic Register. Can you believe it? Every single one, along with a whole bunch of other buildings, too, that we've covered along the way. And I was realizing that Bellingham isn't a super old place. It's not like Boston. It's not like Nashville. We've only been around for about 170 years or so uh, since it was 1853 that Captain Henry Roeder sailed into uh, Bellingham Bay for the first time. So because of that, a lot of these houses were built in the same 20 to 30 year span from about 1890 to the, into the 1920s. And because of that, as I've been researching all of these houses, the same names start popping up over and over and over again. Some of the same architects, some of the same family last names we start seeing over and over because naturally, these were wealthy, influential people um, around the turn of the century here in Bellingham. Bellingham was incorporated as a city in 1903, so there were a lot of big names involved in making that happen. And it is those people's houses that have then lasted for about 100 years or so, and we still have them today. So here are some of the crazy connections and interminglings and weavings and all the tendrils that was Bellingham society around the turn of the century. And I don't even know half the stories. These are just some of the things that I've picked up as I found all these little pieces, these little factoids in 50 some pages of National Historic Register documents. You just start scrolling through and scrolling through and you realize you're starting to see the same names over and over and over again. So let's take a look. First off, we've got Captain Henry Roeder and his wife Elizabeth Roeder. They were among the first white settlers uh, known to settle in this area in Bellingham Bay in the 1850s. And Henry Roeder and Samuel Peabody came up from California looking for a timber source because of the great fires in San Francisco. There was a, a major shortage of timber. So they were looking for new timber stands and heard that there was a place with a waterfall and near to bay access. So there would be uh, shipping access for delivering timber, but a waterfall for running a water mill. And that is what brought them to Lake Whatcom and Bellingham Bay. They also traveled with Edward Eldridge and his family, and uh, this is a family home that was built in the following generation, actually, was the Eldridge Mansion. They had two kids, Lottie and Victor. Lottie married Charles Roth, and she ended up living in Elmheim, which was one of my favorite houses to write about, but you can't see it anymore because it was torn down in 1956 instead of being preserved as a piece of Bellingham history. It was torn down in 1956. Interestingly, at that time, the people who were really trying to save this building and were trying to turn it into a museum or into a community center, anything to keep it from being torn down, they put together a plan to move the building from its uh, location on the corner of Elm Street and Monroe to move it a few blocks to Elizabeth Park. Interestingly enough, Elizabeth Park is actually named after Elizabeth Roeder. It was developed on land donated by Captain Henry Roeder and when it was formed in the early 1900s, Roland Ganwell was actually the park commissioner at the time. So then we fast forward to the 1950s, people have this whole crazy big plan to move this large three-story building onto Elizabeth Park. It didn't happen. House got raised and that story is completed. Victor Roeder is another family member here. He uh, lived in this house for a fair amount of time, which was designed by one of the most prominent architects in the area. And this was a name that I started noticing really early on, Alfred Lee. 
kept popping up. He built, or excuse me, he designed the Robert Morris House, the Alfred Black House, the Victor Roeder House, the Axtell House, which we actually covered just a couple of weeks ago, and that was lived in by Francis Cleveland Axwell, who was not only a state representative and one of the first women assigned to a federal commission by President Woodrow Wilson, she was also cousin of President Grover Cleveland, hence the Cleveland last name, and she was one of the founding members of the Aftermath Club, which was housed in Broadway Hall and bore the distinction of Unlike a lot of the men's clubs of the day, uh, which rented the space that they lived in, like the Cascade Club that Mark Twain actually visited one day, uh, the Aftermath Club ended up buying their space. So they owned Broadway Hall and rented it out for events and such right from the beginning. Another prominent architect of the time was F. Stanley Piper, and the man's name kept popping up on train stations and churches and other houses of these founding members of the community. The first St. Paul's Episcopal Church, it's now called the Parish Hall, it was the original building, was built on land donated by Captain Henry Roeder in the late 1800s, 1883, I believe. Lottie and Charles Roth were the first wedding, had the first wedding held in that building in St. Paul's Parish. Fast forward a generation, the, the building that we know as St. Paul's Episcopal in Bellingham today was designed by F. Stanley Piper, one of the prominent architects of the time, and it was his child who was the first baby christened in that new building in the 1920s, 1925. He also designed the D Street Passenger Station, uh, the Eldridge Mansion, which I think I mentioned is a second generation mansion. The original Eldridge, who sailed with Captain Henry Roeder, their houses burned down and then a few years later this house was built in the 1920s. He also designed, also 1926, the Herald Building, which we see on State Street. One of my absolute favorite stories, though, came out of when I was writing about Lermont Manor and the George Bacon House. So these were two completely separate articles, two separate blog posts that I maybe wrote a month apart from each other, but I started noticing some connections. Uh, the George Bacon House was designed by Henry Bacon, who was a prominent architect, but not from this area. Henry Bacon is actually most famous for designing the Lincoln Memorial. So he designed not only this national monument, but also this little house here right here in Bellingham. He actually gave uh, George Bacon the, the plans for the house as a wedding gift. So he designs the Lincoln Memorial in 1912. Then in 1939, 1939, contralto Marion Anderson is rejected from singing at Constitution Hall by the Daughters of the American Revolution because of her skin color. A lot of people were very upset about this, and a lot of people took the necessary steps to overcome that decision, and she sang to a crowd of over 75,000 people on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. How does that really relate to Bellingham? Well, Lairmont Manor came into play in 1941 when Francis Larrabee found out that there is this visiting contralto named Marian Anderson who had come to sing at a concert in Bellingham and again because of her skin color she was not allowed to sing at the concert hall that was booked for her. Frances Larrabee happened to also be a member of the Daughters of the American Revolution, the organization that had turned Marian Anderson down two years before and back in Washington DC. Well she goes, we're having a concert right here right now at my house. So Marian Anderson, instead of singing at a concert hall in Bellingham, got invited to learn what is now Laramont Manor and gave a private concert for Bellingham Social Elite there instead. Stories about Whatcom County's development center around timber, around coal, and around the railway, as with a lot of things when you talk about western, uh, the western frontier and western developing. In the late 1800s, there was a bid to make either Fairhaven or Bellingham Bay a terminus station for one of the many intercontinental cross-country railroads that were being built in the late 1800s. Fairhaven put in a bid for it, Bellingham Bay put in bids, uh, smaller railways were starting to be developed, Seattle and Tacoma were also putting in bids, and they were the ones that eventually won out for two of the largest intercontinental railway systems that were being built at that time. But as Fairhaven was uh, putting their best foot forward, as it, would, as it were, for a railway terminus station, there were a lot of local boosters uh, 
who made it their job to make the real estate as, as profitable as it could be to enhance industry, basically to make the area very welcoming and very conducive to industry. So you have people like uh, James Warner, Wardner, excuse me, who bought up 135 lots in Fairhaven as a speculative investor and then wanted to hold it and sell them off in parcels to the other businesses that were coming into the area. But the story of the railway coming into Bellingham, coming into Fairhaven, has some just plain human elements to it that I just find way too funny. So you have small railways that are trying to make the area look attractive, show that we can we can welcome these large intercontinental railway stations. So, but there's not quite the budget to actually run a real railway. So we can build a couple miles of track and just have two trains that just go back and forth and back and forth. But not all the time, of course, either, because we just need to wait when the new ships of delegates come up into Bellingham Bay. Then let's start running the trains and making it look like it's such a thriving place of industry around here. When the railway went through uh, Sumas, actually, and it was one of the first international railway stations was built through the Sumas area, there was a celebration and people were waiting for a train to come through, excuse me, from the north with a whole bunch of Canadian delegates on it that were coming to celebrate the, the linking of these two railway lines. Well, the train took a long time to show up. And it kept taking a long time to show up. So a few different fire stations decided, who were there for the celebration, decided that they would start a water fight from two different sides of the train station and two different sides of the railway track. And they were having a grand old time water fighting each other and then the train of delegates came through and all the water broke the windows and soaked these visiting delegates and I just love that story and I just love this story because no matter how the history books talk about westward expansion and when they talk about building the railroads and timber industry, it's always very serious and it's always very, and then this railway came to Whatcom County and this railway had its terminus in Seattle and we lost the bid for Fairhaven and went to Tacoma instead. But human nature doesn't really change and you're always gonna have firefighters starting water fights. This house was built about that time and it was lived in by J.J. Donovan who was an engineer for the railway industry. Donovan, you might recognize that name because yes, he is the Donovan of Bloedel Donovan Park. Bloedel Donovan Park is now where one of the original Bloedel lumber mills was built at that end of Lake Whatcom. And Bloedel had, had timber experience, Donovan had railway experience, and he used that, they kind of leveraged that special side skill that he had as a railway engineer to build all these little tiny connecting railway lines so that they could pull a timber from the stands at the southern end of Lake Whatcom and instead of shipping them through Lake Whatcom the way that everybody else was doing it using boats, they ran them around the, the perimeter of Lake Whatcom. They could get timber to their mill faster and then down Whatcom Creek, past Whatcom Creek, down to the bay. And so that's one way that Blodell, the Blodell Donovan Alliance became a dominant lumber mill in the area, bought out some of the other lumber mills before they finally closed as well. So this has been a kind of an amazing project to work on. It's become bigger and more engaging and more alive than I ever anticipated it would be. The first couple of blog posts were all about this carving on this staircase that I learned about. And it shifted pretty quickly to being these stories of real people who lived right in this area and had their homes on, on State Street or on Garden Street or on South Hill. And it's kind of an amazing thing to drive down State Street and see the lights of the Herald building and see the Morse hardware facade and drive through Fairhaven and, and just drive right by one of these houses that I know the backstory of or I know the person who lived there for so long and this person who made their own impact on Whatcom County. And I've sometimes thought that it would be cool to live in a place like Washington DC or a place like Paris or a place like Boston, a place that has so much history for a civilization. And I'm coming to realize more and more that each of these smaller stories that we're highlighting, that we're pulling out of these normal houses of their era from just about 100 to 130 years ago, uh, it tells a story of someone who we don't know of and who was kind of a nobody 
who had some influence, who made a difference, and who shaped and affected Bellingham and Whatcom County for what it is for us today.